We are now recording, and I would like to welcome each of you to our third go to training session for the course leadership assessment and evaluation. As you can see from the screen, and as you well know by this time, we are on module five, which is akin to chapter four in the book, which deals with building relationships by communicating supportively. And hopefully my wife will pick that up. She's upstairs or we will get rid of it. I just did. Um, so let me, uh, let me first of all, before we even get into tonight, ask if there are any questions or concerns, any difficulties in accessing the material, uh, you know, anything of an administrative matter that I can maybe help you with, clear up or be aware of at least, and then take action. So anybody have any, uh, you know, any any issues or anything that they wanna throw out as far as those kinds of things? Nope, okay. So let me just roll on to what I have put down as the objectives. And again, every one of these things is fluid so that if we don't cover something that you would like to cover, um, you know, just chime in and, and I'll do my best to integrate it into our discussion this evening. But as you can see there, and you know, we're, we've just now launched uh, the module five building relationships by communicating supportively. So you've been doing the work obviously on module three, which is stress management and the last week we had problem solving, both from an analytical and then a creative perspective. Want to talk a little bit about that. We, we did talk a little bit about stress management. We'll go over that quickly. But the problem solving from the analytical and then also the creative side, I think warrants um, a little bit of a discussion. And then want to uh, talk about by way of introduction, at least, the the building relationships by communicating supportively. But I also wanted to take this opportunity as we enter week five of the course to share a little bit about the Ewing paper and also, uh, you know, some materials that you may have discovered that I've included in the resource materials for the course. Uh, that will give you an idea of what a Ewing paper may look like or could look like based on a couple of examples, but doesn't necessarily have to adhere to that particular format or framework. So uh, again, I'm assuming that before I flip to the slide, um, any questions at this point, and <coughs> any comments? or issues. And I apologize, I've been dealing with, haven't gotten sick, but I've been dealing with a number of the uh, cold-related symptoms like a dry cough. So I'm chomping away here at a cough drop and hopefully it will not be too much of a distraction. Okay, so a couple of things we will not spend time on, but just to rehash it. We've been working through the five-stage learning model, five-step learning model. We are now, uh, as you can see, communicating supportively. The authors have put, as you probably well know from your textbook as well, have put under the interpersonal uh, quadrant of skills. Um, and we will be talking about that tonight and then moving on to things around motivating employees and so forth. But for the most part, up to this, we have been dealing with uh, the left-hand quadrant, the personal kinds of things. How do we go about uh, developing an awareness of ourselves? How do we go about managing and understanding the stressors in our lives? And uh, what do we do about uh, getting to the bottom of uh, things that might be uh, roadblocks by solving them either in a rational, logical way or through some innovative kinds of things. And now we're moving over 
and launching the idea of, hey, we're not the only ones around here. Our job as a manager is to work through and with people. So that's the pie shape. Again, the whole idea of the flexibility and the stability, the internal and the external. And we'll actually be looking at, if you have your book with you or nearby, I would suggest that maybe you want to reach for that because there are a couple of uh, figures or exhibits in the chapter um, you know, dealing with creative problem solving in particular that I'm going to call your attention to, and it might help you to visualize what we're talking about by looking at these figures. In particular, it's going to be figures 3.1, 3.2, and 3.3, starting on page 145 of your textbook, just by way of giving you another handle on that. But the reason why I raise that is <coughs> the same dimensions of internal, external, and control and flexibility are also used by the authors because they're trying to give you a sense of the continuity. Um, it's not a one-off chart that you never see again, but the same kinds of, of dimensions operate if you use those same um you know, those same, well, I guess the same kind of attributes and skills operate if you use the same kind of dimensions that they have there. So that's our matrix. Um, so let me just, you know, kind of use this slide as a uh, kind of a quick review because I want to spend the majority of our time talking about the issue of uh, problem solving. But one of the things that we talked about under that whole idea of managing personal stress was uh, one is that we're, when we're under stress, as you may uh, no doubt know, and, uh, and I am, by, by the way, there's been a gap in my grading. You know, I did a couple of things. I caught up through, I think, module two. I'm going to now be reading modules three and four. We were out of town and rather than take everything with me, and I had limited internet availability to go up on the grade chart. But now that I'm back home, I will be um, reading that work of module uh, modules uh, three and four tomorrow. So um, you know, we'll have a chance to, uh, um, you know, to get my feedback on that. But at any event, in the chapter that dealt with um, that dealt with managing personal stress, we can see there as a, just a reminder that when we're hit with stress, you know, the first thing is our body kind of goes into a hair in the back of our neck, stands up figuratively, sometimes literally. We go in through a kind of uh, you know tenseness and alert mode and an alarm kind of goes off in our brain and we start questioning about whether we you know should deal with it in this way or that way or what are we going to do and so forth and so on and after it becomes kind of inborn if you will uh, it becomes sort of systemic to the way we operate sometimes we we try to protect ourselves by going into a kind of shutdown mode. And that's what that resistance is all about. We try to ignore it. We try to placate the symptoms by thinking about or figuring out something else. And that's good. I mean, that's not simply defensive mechanisms. That are, those are mechanisms to try to divert our attention from um, going into uh, a panic mode by, you know, uh, focusing on other things that take our mind off of the undesirable or stressful situation. But eventually, if that's the way we operate, we run out of gas. And it's like staying up all night and doing some really good work. And then you hit a point where you just are not thinking clearly and, <coughs> and you're preoccupied with just kind of muddling through and 
you feel that um, the, you know, the end doesn't appear to be there close enough that you can realize it. And so you go into basically some form of exhaustion. You just, you just run out of energy, energy units. And if stress continues for that period of time, then that's what happens to us. We, we just become debilitated by the very stress. So the idea of managing our stress is really critical. And it's kind of like when you're on an airliner and you'll hear about, should you need, uh, should the, the uh, uh, cabin lose pressure and the oxygen mass will come down from the compartments above you, you're always instructed, put your own mask on first before you tend to your children or other ones whom you care about. And there, that may seem like self-serving. I'm going to take care of myself first. But if you can get that oxygen flowing to you, then you remain alert and able to care for and serve those whom you are concerned about. If you start working with them, you pass out because you have lack of oxygen. So the idea here is, again, this is on the self-preservation on that far left quadrant on the circle. We're talking about ourselves, managing ourselves so that we can then become uh, able and have the energy and have the, the wherewithal to deal with others. So you can see the stressors there. And typically, I might have a conversation around that. But I want to move through this slide, uh, except for, you know, kind of a general question when I'm done. And that is, I've at, you know, you had one of the assignments. Well, if time, which it often can be, uh, creates stress, because without adequate time, you find that you are battling, um, you know, battling the resources that you have available to you. If time is uh, a stressor, then the best way to do that is through time management. So you had an assignment that said, write down several, two, three uh, things that you will try um, as time management techniques, and then keep a, a kind of a record of whether those things that hopefully you are able to execute and really do um, in the way you intend them to, to be done, if they help you, <coughs> if they help you, you know, deal with the jobs that you have to get done, remain more resilient and resistant to other kinds of things. So in a couple of weeks, I'm going to say to you, submit uh, and, and um, you know, it may even be this week. I don't think I've asked that for this week, but submit and give kind of a your own impression as to whether those things worked. And again, I'm going to stress that if they didn't work, say that because you're not graded on, oh, it didn't work, so I'll pretend that it did work so I get a better grade. It's all about trying things and seeing if there's they are effective in helping you become a better, stronger person. So we have the encounter stressors, which, um, you know, when you have a situation where you're going to be encountering somebody that maybe you've had some difficulty in dealing with um, or a situation that typically, um, you know, creates anxiety for you with respect to another person or a group of people. And there you can see that uh, SIEI, social intelligence, emotional intelligence, understanding yourself, understanding the perspective of the other person, understanding that they may be feeling exactly as you feel, and then moving toward collaboration can often be a way of confronting the situation constructively and moving through it. So the encounter stressors, you know, are, are very uh, uh, um, receptive to your working with that stress and not shying away from it rather than to ignore it or 
simply back burner it because it doesn't go away. It's always there, if not actively, at least in a dormant type of relationship. Situational uh, t- types of uh, stresses or stresses called caused by situations. Very often we talk about work redesign. Are there ways for you to do your job differently? Are there ways for you to work through your supervisor to create opportunities for you to enjoy more what you're doing, even though some of the tasks are um, ones that need to get done, whether you like them or not. But if there's ways of creating opportunities for you to feel growth and development and self-worth, then that works. And anticipatory stressors are that is that free-floating kind of anxiety, even though Uh, it hasn't occurred, you're almost dwelling on it. You're almost envisioning the kind of pain and discomfort and um, lack of um, easiness that you have in anticipating what may be happening. Sometimes it's just free floating and people might say, I'm anxious. This is anxiety. What's it about? I don't know. I just feel anxious. So that whole situation is related to helping you pre- present to yourself some structure and some certainty by prioritizing and by goal setting. So that's it. And again, we could have had a, a, a fairly robust discussion about that. But in order to cover that waterfront and give us time to, uh, to, to spend some more time with problem solving, I wanted to go over what, to me, this slide encapsulated. Now, my question in general to all of you is, uh, what, if any, of these uh, have you encountered? And maybe just one example. I mean, what, you know, you can pick one example, but I'd like to hear, since there's three of us, just from each of you, um, and as, as individuals, it's likely that we've had some situation, even though maybe we've done a good job of managing it, that would fall into one of those four categories of time, encounter, situational, or anticipatory types of stressors. And just a word or two about what it was and how you dealt with it. So um, do I have a volunteer? Because there's three of you guys, and I'd like to hear so, Aaron, thank you for raising your hand so promptly, and go ahead and share with us what, um, you know, what your response is. So, one that often comes up at work is um, situational. So, things are very uh, cyclical at work because we move according to like board cycles. Yeah. But it seems that because we can anticipate these board cycles. People are in the groove of like waiting until our deadlines to move our documents along prior to making things like a priority to work on and get like final drafts finished of. Right. And so one thing that I found that can be really helpful is if I do what I would be responsible for ahead of time and kind of kick that along to my other teammates to say, hey, I know this is due on such and such. But here's my portion or here's my piece or I went ahead and created the template or draft that we all need to work in collaboratively. And often that like triggers them saying, oh, I should probably be thinking about this too. So it's like a way of gently nudging folks along and also making sure that like I am not personally stressed because I've already made my contribution. Are you are you in a position? It sounds as if you are, but are you in a position to initiate without having to wait for, like if you were third in line in a sequence, you'd have to wait for person number one and number two to do their things and then pass, figuratively pass the baton on to you. Are you in sort of the lead position where you can uh, kick the ball off and get things rolling? I I would argue that in some ways, yes, and in some ways, no. So like, because 
because it's like grant specific and it's yeah. many people talking about their grants, the ones that fall under my purview by way of what my boss oversees, I'm able to write about those and kind of get that done and out of the way because we're already aware of like which grants are going before the board. We already have their applications and proposals by the time that we're writing these documents. Right. So oftentimes I'm able to to initiate in the way that you said, even though it's kind of like equal footing across the board, so long as that final document is completed by that deadline. Yeah. Okay. Um, it sounds good. And it sounds like a, it sounds like it works for you because a, it relieves your anxiety in terms of a situational uh, stressor. And it also tends to be a stimulus when it's, when it's working well for others to, um, you know, to kind of say, oh, here's a product. Uh, I can either sit on it, which is their discretion, or I can start taking action on my part of what I need to do. So it acts as a little bit of an incentive, I think, that they're getting something from you earlier than a crisis type deadline. So that sounds very helpful. So thank you. Um, so Colleen or, <coughs> or Emily, um, what kinds of stressors and, and what nature of stressor have, have you encountered and uh you know what does that what does that look like how have you handled it so colleen i see a an active mic go ahead uh sure so um one of the major stressors i've been having um trouble with lately is um the time uh time stressor i have been um crazy busy out of the office um like if you put all the days I've been out of the office together, it'd be like a month. So it's just insane. So my time in the office is very hectic and um, it got to the point where I was actually supposed to be at a um, filming in Donovan and I showed up to the office and was like an hour late to the filming. So it got kind of crazy. Um, so what I did was I, you know, I had a discussion with my, my VP and we decided that I needed to take set aside time for myself um, to get organized. She said I needed to start making lists and um, keeping my calendar updated. So um, I kind of just did this like uh, time management stuff. I, I I have to set aside time for myself in the beginning of the week to get organized and and just make to do lists and things like that. So uh, now that so that's kind of in line with the assignment of, uh, you know, trying to experiment with what is it and all people react differently to different things. What, you know, how can I best manage my time? What are the things uh, that I can follow through with and that I can be consistent with? Um, where are you in that process? Are, are you just starting now or have you done it for a while? And if so, um, well, I, I I started with the list back like maybe a month or two, or you know, no, that was back in November. Um, so I started with it, and then when we got this assignment, I revisited it because I kind of got lax with it. Um, because it's you know, it's kind of like starting a New Year's resolution. You're like, oh, I'm totally gonna do this every day, and then you're back. um, so when we got the assignment, I re I revisited it, and I have been making my sort of lists at least once a week, and and keeping track of that, of all my projects. Yeah. Well, that th this is going to dovetail, as it sounds like it is, very nicely with, um, number one, with the assignment, and more importantly, with the course, because it sounds like, you know, and, and, and I'm hoping that each of us find that what we're covering in the course is really relevant. Because when something becomes relevant, and sometimes it's, as I say, Necessity is the mother of invention. You know, if we have to, sometimes that gets us off of our complacency kick. And, and then if we have a convenient uh, other incentive, like an assignment or something that someone else has asked us to do, which is consistent, that acts as sort of a double stimulus for us to get started. So um, I wish you well. And I, and I uh, you know, I'm looking forward to when we kind of ask for some feedback as to whether those techniques uh, that you're trying now and, and like setting deadlines and 
prioritizing and so forth um, are, you know, are helping. So thank you. Um, yep. So, um, okay. so um, Emily, are you, uh, do you have an example you can share with us? Um, <clears throat> sure. I mean, there are a lot of the, the, the same things that Aaron and Colleen are talking about with, um, hey. oh, wait a minute. Hey, Aaron. Hey, Aaron. Can you, Hi, yes. can you mute I'm your sorry, mic? I didn't know that my, I'm sorry. I didn't That's know okay. My mic wasn't muted. That's okay. My I heard, I heard a very lovely sound, but <laughs> thanks. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Emily. Go ahead. No, no, that's okay. Um, uh, I guess my my current position is very. Uh, I have a lot of deadlines. Uh, it's very deadline driven because it's it's a lot of emails that have to go out at specific times uh, because they're based on promoting um, events. So it, it took me a good year to kind of get in my own rhythm and kind of figure out you know, what was a priority, what was not a priority. Um, and in hearing um, Colleen and Aaron talk, it made me think about the chapter and, and how it emphasized not reacting to urgent issues, but only reacting to important issues, mm, which yeah. I kind of struggle with because <laughs> urgent issues are usually coming from your boss. <laughs> That's how I define them. And if you're not reacting to those urgent issues, it's usually a problem. So maybe I just wasn't understanding it correctly, but that's something that I kind of struggled with in the reading. Yeah. Uh, well, here's here's something to think about. And actually, as we get into the course a little bit more, and I know we're we're now on, <clears throat> excuse me, we're now on uh, module five already out of a, a eight week session. But when we talk about communicating, we talk about conflict management, we talk about motivating and so forth. Um, one of the terms that I'm sh sure you've heard, but I think we get some w opportunity to work in this area is managing upward so that you're right. Sometimes if it's our own priority, we can say, well, I'm going to put it aside. But if it's coming from somebody who has a uh, uh, discretionary and reward slash punish punishment um, capability over us, like our supervisor or boss, we sometimes um, see that as I must do it because, you know, it's my boss. Uh, so one of the things that managing upward or, and communicating effectively to do that is all about is to uh, inform the supervisor of the constraints that you have and of the priorities that maybe the boss himself or herself has asked you to do and say, you know, um, I know these three things are important, but, you know, can you help me by prioritizing them? Because trying to get them all done at the same time is a little bit of circuit overload given these other priorities, and I want to be responsive to you. Most bosses will take that not as a sign of weakness or inability, but a sign of someone being structured and organized, systematic, and being able to achieve results that the boss, oftentimes the boss will say, oh, I forgot all about that other thing. No, no, push that aside. That's not as important as this or whatever. So one of the things that <coughs> these, if you will, externally derived priorities can, can, how they can be managed is by this upward management of a boss. I don't want to make it sound like, oh, it's a piece of cake, because you also have to look at, you know, how, how am I going to be perceived? And you have to know your boss. But if that person is a good manager, as we are trying to become, um, then they will be at least appreciative and sensitive to, you know, the whole idea of you can only get so much done and maybe I have to, as the boss, prioritize a little bit or help you in prioritizing. Um, and I've had both experiences, frankly. You know, I've had some people go, oh, my God, yes. And other people go, tough, get it done. You know, so I'm not suggesting that 
you just say these magic words and everybody falls into line. You have to look at your own situation, but it's a way of, of managing it. Well, thank you each for giving you know examples of how these stressors can and do operate and how they can be fairly uh, significant. Uh, what I want to do now is I want to talk to I want to talk a little bit here just in this about uh, and again, I'll kind of take this over so that we can work through it. But given what you've just said by way of absolute examples, you can say that, um, you know, resilience is considered the idea of you can literally uh, bounce back up and be resilient when things are not necessarily going in a way that's smooth and predictable and uh, certain and also to the best of your uh, sense of how things should go, capacity to withstand or manage negative effects of stress. And as I said here, bounce back. So you can see the two main categories are if you're feeling good about yourself, which is why emotional intelligence always starts with you rather than with empathizing with other people or, as they say, putting yourself in their shoes or any of the other attributes or qualities. It always says, get your own head in order understand yourself, understand how you can best manage and become the most resilient you can yourself before you start reaching out to and with other people. So personal factors, self-regard is a big thing, which is why I want us to really use this course as a reflective opportunity to see what, what how we feel about ourselves and if we're not feeling as great as we want to, what we can do about it. And then personal coping strategies is really things that we can say more mechanics, but not less important, saying, well, if I put all of my energy in this arena, then I'm sort of leaving these other two arenas or three arenas of my life sort of uh, unattended to. And so let's achieve a little balance here. And how can I uh, deal with one thing and yet not uh, exhaust the energy and, and, and the capability I have of dealing with and enjoying the other elements of my life? So, so trying to adapt, understand, adapt, and grow, and, and then implement coping mechanisms, coping strategies to achieve this, this uh, balance is the other side of it. And sometimes they, you know, they often go hand in glove. That is, you feel better about yourself when we've done something, when we've achieved something and go, whoa, I would may not have tried that or done that, but now I can and I did. And the results are surprisingly better than I anticipated. So that's the first part of that slide. And the second part is really another way to look at it. It's, it's um, physiological. You know, obviously, if we're exhausted, we're not at our top condition, which is why they say exercise. And I can tell you that, you know, I talk a great game, but my wife will turn to me and say, when's the last time you were at the gym? And so she got me to agree very recently because of a, uh, a visit to the doctor who said, well, all the, all the numbers of the organs and everything, they're all fine. But if you're feeling tired, it's more physiological than it is in terms of anything wrong with a particular, you know, internal organ. And so essentially you're out of shape and you should look at getting in shape almost as a job. You sit down and talk with your students, you know, you grade papers, you should make time to go to the gym. So that's my latest um, late New Year's resolution because my wife was there, you know, with a wet noodle beating me. And uh, she is she is my taskmaster because of love, basically. Psychological is obviously, as it says, and as most of us, if we're feeling down in the dumps, if we're feeling kind of, uh, you know, that things are not looking all that bright, if we're, if we're psychologically exhausted, 
uh, tired from struggling with something, uh, we have to do our best to try to engage ourselves so that we can become awakened uh, from a uh, metaphorical sense in our brain as well. Keep us stimulated, keep us thinking actively, get our brain to function. And of course, as you probably know, the more research they're doing on uh, debilitating illnesses like Alzheimer's is saying that if you are stimulating your brain and learning new things and building synopsis in your brain's uh, waves and, and the linkages, that you are in effect also uh, creating uh, inhibitors to Alzheimer's. It's not an all and be and you know be all uh, end all, but it helps. And then social is again we're different animals. Some of us like to be private and alone and get our energy by reading a book and quietly by being ourselves. And others are much more extrovertish. But if we're totally isolated on either end of the continuum. We are, um, you know, we're remote and we are removed from social contact, which is, you know, kind of atrophying. And on the other hand, if we're total party animals, we don't have any time for reflection. We don't have any time for, um, uh, you know, kind of just recharging our battery <coughs> without always being, quote, on, quote, unquote and being in a party animal. So the whole idea of those three elements working together is, um, is important to, you know, to our well-being. Um, so before we go on, any questions, any, any further comments about what we've been talking about in terms of personal stress, which was way back in, you know, uh, chapter two, basically, that we got into um, in, the, in the book, you know, Module three, I guess. So, not seeing any, let me move on to the analytical problem solving issues that we have. And um, so, you know, this is showing us what, what we know. If, if we have a problem and uh, it's something that seems like we can get our arms around it, then there are some definite steps at um, at doing that. And we often find ourselves in situations that seem familiar, but they're not exactly identical. But the link to or the or the jump to resolving that problem appears to be w under the umbrella or within the reach of, of um, previous problem solving activity or resolution of problems that we've had before. And so the steps in that situation, which is which is really where problems are more known and they're more predictable and they seem to be sort of common sense, but maybe still uncertain in terms of the final analysis, is that as you can see there, you know, there is a four-step process of defining the problem and then really understanding the problem and then generating alternatives to a possible solution and then evaluating those alternatives so that we can weigh, weigh them and see what seems to be the, uh, you know, the most reasonable and viable uh, alternative to pursue, and then going ahead and implementing the solution. And if things tend to be, again, um, you know, in a vein that we are somewhat comfortable with, but we, we uh, haven't necessarily encountered this exact problem, then that's a strategy and that's an approach that, um, you know, that really works well in those kinds of situations. Um, so it's, you know, a short way to say it is it's, it's easiest to apply for problems where they're straightforward and clear, where information and alternatives are available, and where there seems to be a clear standard 
against which we can evaluate each of those alternatives and then take action. So that's the creative problem solving. Um, let's turn to a situation where it's not so uh, predictable or familiar or where information isn't as readily available. <clears throat> and we need to figuratively and metaphorically think out of the box as the old, <clears throat> as the saying goes. <clears throat> and let's refer to that as creative problem solving. And your book gives you, you know, that gave you that information and, and gave you some, some thoughts about that. Um, so, you know, let's again, just share if we had a situation where it wasn't a, oh yeah, same old, same old, or close enough that I can make a conceptual jump, or I did this last time and here were the three things or four things I thought about where something really kind of like for you was a different you know, unusual, unfamiliar situation uh, or problem. And you had to kind of reach way back and maybe get creative in order to, you know, to address that problem. Um, so before I call on anybody, let me just ask in general, if anybody wants to volunteer with any situation that might reflect those kinds of more unpredictable uh, dimensions. So, anybody? So let me ask a another question that might stimulate some thought, and then we'll come back to this one. Um, I'm assuming that maybe we've had a situation like this, but it might be hard to kind of put it into words. Um, what do you think are the blockers? And your book went into this in, in some degree, but but just from your own words, what are some of the things that maybe if you're struck with a new, different, unusual, unfamiliar kind of a situation might stand in your way to uh, just jump right in and solve the problem. What are the kinds of things that, you know, in your own words, you don't have to remember what the terms are in the book or anything, but what are the kind of things that might stand in your way to, uh, to kind of coming up with a solution? So, Emily, thank you. Uh, sure. So, um, I thought they were talking about vertical thinking and how um, you perceive a problem to, you diagnose a pro problem almost like prematurely, and you kind of have this narrow vision of, of what the problem is and how it can be solved and aren't really thinking about not taking in any of the other cues or environmental cues or other factors that, you know, may affect or may signify to you that it's another problem. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's a, that's a great, that's a great example. Uh, I don't know if you're like me, but I certainly have encountered situations where I've looked at something, looked at something, looked at something. In fact, in that, um, in that chapter, there were those, um, diagrams that ask you to solve the pictures. And uh, I have to admit, <clears throat> I mean, I used a teacher's guide because I was frustrated. I wasn't very good at solving. I think there may have been five or so of those little pictures that said, you know, what do you do here? Or what's the answer? And um, of course, now I'm, you know, it's kind of like, okay, I know the answer. So I, I see it. But, um, but um, you know, we, we, to your point, we look at something in a way that is the way we've always looked at it. And, you know, the term in the book that they use is constancy. 
but it is vertical thinking. We're not considering alternatives or we're not considering another way to look at it or we interpret it by using in our brain language that defines it in a certain way. And all of that, while it helps us to frame it, also creates borders or boundaries and prevents us from looking at how somebody else might see it. And somebody else might see it differently. We go, oh my God, how'd I miss that? And But that's just the nature of who we are. So clearly, <coughs> excuse me, the idea of, of thinking things in a constant way, vertical thinking, uh, using the same language is one of the blockers that is a set, you know, that it comes up often to, um, you know, to saying, okay, this is what I see and this is only what I see. So a- anything else, and don't worry about what the book calls it, but just maybe your own experience of, um, you know, how it felt or what it, what it looked like, um, you know, when you, when you went and when you encountered this kind of situation, this type of problem and why it became a big deal because of the nature of that problem. What other kinds of dynamics were operating? And by the way, if you've contributed and you want to contribute again, that's fine too. But just wondering whether, uh, Colleen, any, any thoughts about what might be operating as far as you're concerned? And again, don't worry about the language of the book or the labels. I'm less concerned about that and more concerned about us understanding what the heck's going on. Sure. Um, I mean, I find that I do have a problem with um, uh, not asking, <laughs> not asking a lot of questions and kind of just going along with things. And I feel like that kind of gets people into trouble uh, when they kind of not not so much. They think that they know everything, but they just don't care to to ask follow up questions. Like complacency is is a is a big problem. Yeah, yeah, and and you know your book mentions a bunch, and you know when we encounter these things, I mean, if you're like me, you know, it, the bell doesn't go on in your head and go, oh, this is a complacency issue that I have. I mean, it plays itself out in like, am I really that interested or? I'm ready to accept what I know, or um, I'm a little bit hesitant to ask the question because I may not look all that great when I ask the question, you know, and we've all been in situations where we sort of evaluate, uh, yeah, I, I like to know, but what's the risk and all of that, which is why I keep saying no risk in this class. But when you go out into the workplace and you go out with even social members, you know, it's almost like, what's that mean can be something that you're hesitant in asking. What do you mean? You don't know what that means. You know, oh, my God, where have you been putting your head in the sand? And, you know, and we get all kinds of stuff. So complacency, broadly speaking, is another reason um, that that we did that. The, the two other ones, just to kind of round out several that the book has listed and then and then going back to maybe, you know, just talking briefly about uh, the, the kinds of um, improvement or thinking out of the box that we can have. But the two other ones that the, that the book has is um, sometimes, you know, they say the more effort you spend doing something, the more time you've devoted to doing something, to putting time in on working with something or thinking about something, the more committed you are to that point of view because you have more investment. And so, you know, when you start a new job, you're probably asking yourself frequently, do I like this job? Was this the right choice? Uh, Do I think I'll succeed here? Am I going to learn? Is it going to be what I want? Or or should I just bail quickly in the next six months and just take my licks and get out of here or whatever? But when you're in a job for a number of years, then you start asking things like, well, you know, I've been putting my time in. I've gotten a couple of raises. People seem to like me. I'm not all that happy, but what about moving, all the stress that that creates? And, and so the more time we have in commitment, the more, the harder it is 
to shift gears and to think about different things. And so commitment or the inability or unwillingness to change our perspective comes, uh, it's kind of, you know, correlated with time and amount of energy we've invested in that. And then then the final thing that that the authors talk about is um, this term they call compression, but it's looking very narrowly at a problem and defining it in a very restricted way. And you screen out so much information um, that you are not accepting, you know, alternative information. So it's a little bit like constancy because you're used to thinking things in a way, but at this point, you're, you're almost shutting out um, alternative information. And in fact, if you think about somebody who is a zealot, I mean, they're just totally, totally, they could be a religious zealot or they could be an intellectually a zealot or they can, whatever their discipline, whatever their orientation, if they are so far on the extremes of, you know, thinking about things in an even keel, if they're so wedded to the extreme views, they are basically shutting out alternative information. And one of the definitions of uh, schizophrenia, you know, uh, is that, and this was presented to me years ago by a psychiatrist, is that you, you don't, you might hear voices, etc., but you don't hear rational alternative thinking. It is not part of the process. You have just shielded it out. Now that's an extreme, but if we're a problem solver and we are so, um, you know, compression oriented in our thinking, we've basically squeezed out anything that would make sense because it is different from what our logic tells us is truth. And so the authors say that. So if we say that, then the authors say, okay, look, there are a number of, of uh, things that we, you know, might be able to do to kind of uh, free up our creative thinking. And if you look at, for instance, in your textbook, just as an example, uh, page 145, figure 3.1, it talks about four types of creativity. And it talks about things like imagination, which is the creation of new ideas and breakthroughs and radical, you know, kinds of approaches. And it tends to be fairly um, large and, you know, that sort of thing. And it, it tends to be more creative. And then the next one is uh, through improvement, which if you drew an arrow from imagination down through improvement, improvement is if imagination is the big, brand new, high risk, big transformational thing, improvement is you make gradual improvements. You say, well, how are you doing on your driving? Oh, I'm a little bit better now. Or if somebody is in rehabilitation, my, my sister-in-law just uh, fell and needed a, a steel rod to be put in her leg, and she's in rehab right now. Um, her dog had yanked her, and she fell and crushed her, her uh, femur. Um, so she's in rehab, which is gradual improvement, not imagination, not radical kinds of stuff. And then if you're talking about um, the... <clears throat> The, the creativeness that comes from investment, it, you know, that also is on the, you know, the right-hand side along with imagination, but it's rapid pursuit of goals, as you can see there in figure 3.1, and it, and it deals with meeting new challenges directly and competitively and, uh, you know, attack the problem directly and all of that. And then on the other side, you have more toward the internal, you have incubation, which, you know, deals with teamwork and involvement and coordination among people and co- cohesion and kind of collaboration and 
it comes from creativity arises from collective minds working together. So that when we talk about creative problem solving, when you think about this, in many cases, you have somebody who is just like, you know, a lightning rod for new ideas and is like a Stephen Jobs or somebody like that, Steve Jobs, you know, just a creative genius that just spikes things. On the other hand, you have situations where they tell people to go off and as a group rework something and come up with an idea that it will have sustaining power, but that reflects all of the members of the group. And they actually have a term in business called skunk works. And skunk works is when you start a little satellite operation and you say to them, don't be encumbered by all the rules and regulations of the company, all of the kinds of restrictions. You guys are off on your own. You're like in a little campsite doing your own thing. And, you know, you develop whatever mechanisms and whatever infrastructure you need. But the name of the game is to become an incubator. And we talk about incubators for new businesses where you can have the, the trial and tribulation and the idea of going through other people. So that ch chart with its two by two matrix is what I was referring to earlier that um, brings up the same dimensions as on that competing frameworks that we had that we had seen, you know, earlier in, in uh, you know, in our uh, entree to this whole thing about leadership and management and all of that. So. Um, Let me just see if I can. So, you know, before, so that's what I wanted to have you take away. And I guess the one question I would ask you, let me just go back to this so that I don't have the communication stuff in front of us. But the one question I would have is, if you are not a, you know, a brilliant, uh, thought-provoking, um, out-of-the-box thinker, uh, a creative artistic, blue sky, you know, visionary, and I'm trying to throw every word in there that communicates that, what, <clears throat> what can you do, given what we've just talked about, to enable you to come up with the very kinds of, uh, of innovations and solutions that you're looking to do while you yourself um, have only a modicum of that attribute in you. What kinds of things might you do as managers uh, to um, enable you to achieve what you're looking for, realizing your own limitations? So any ideas from you three ladies? Well, let me ask you. Okay, Aaron, thank you. Uh, I was going to say, you know, maybe think of a problem situation that you've had and how'd you get around it. But go ahead. What, um, what were you going to say, Aaron? <laughs> oh, one thing that comes up a lot at my job is that there are a lot of processes in place. Yep. So there's been a lot of thought given to like the various departments that should weigh in and so on and so forth. And a lot of times we get so accustomed to process that we don't take an alternative view of problems or we don't examine things from multiple perspectives. So one thing if I were a manager that I would encourage is like making sure I disclose to those who are reporting to me that yes, there still is a process that we have to adhere to. But let's cast the process aside when we're thinking about how we might attack a problem. Because a lot of times I think you're asking people to turn their creativity off if you're asking them to always move forward with that process in mind. And, you know, that is an excellent point. And very often, I mean, processes are, as you point up, processes are important because they outline for us um, the way things get done. 
and what has been deemed to be an efficient and an effective way of doing it so that we're not all, you know, doing trial and error every time. However, <laughs> however, <laughs> however <laughs> um, one of the things that was found when we talk about creativeness and um, and finding people who are um, excellent high performers is to catch, as they always say, catch somebody doing something right. Well, that that works with performance evaluation. But what it also means is sometimes we are quick to say, don't do it that way. That's not the way it's supposed to be done. And if we looked and saw that the person did an innovative or a shortcut or did a little bit of a twist on an old routine, their results were higher, more successful, and they did it more smoothly, they did it more quickly, more efficiently, and we might say, whoa, you know, that is an interesting way to do it, and it does break the rules. We are diverting ourselves from the, quote, established process because we're allowing ourselves to experiment a little bit. So I think your point is is a good one. You don't want to do it all the time, but if you find people doing something and you say, how did you get there so fast? Take time to understand because you may be saying, oh, we're doing this because somebody else did it. And then you say, well, why are you doing it? I don't know. We've always done it this way. And it is not necessarily the best way to do it. And that's one of the ways in process improvement that I used to ask the question, why, at least five times, each time we bring it more backstream, upstream. And finally, you get to a point, <coughs> I don't know, we always did it since so-and-so was hired. And then you find out, well, yeah, but it doesn't really, doesn't really serve us well. So challenging what you're doing and allowing um, alternatives to surface without becoming haphazard is a great, is a great way of doing it. So let me, in, the, in light of our time, because I want to just touch on the communication and then leave time to talk about the Ewing paper. And so thank you very much for your comment, by the way. That was an excellent comment, and I appreciate you volunteering. Um, so, you know, you can see it there that communication is important because it helps you, you know, not only build supportive relationships, even when delivering negative advice or negative feedback, avoiding being defensive and dis disconfirmation uh, in, in your interpersonal communication, um, improving the ability to apply principles of supportive communication in a way that engenders uh, the person listening to you and helps them understand what you know, you really mean and the fact that you are, um, you know, that you are in fact very concerned about and interested in their well-being and that you're not just giving directives to that. And by doing so, it basically improves the relationship because you're using communication not as a vehicle to make an assignment. The assignment can be made in a number of different ways but as a vehicle to build support for the initiative and to engage others and enlist them in, um, in doing that. And your authors, and I'll just read this one definition because I think it's good, your authors say, supportive communication is the kind of interpersonal communication that allows someone to communicate both accurately and honestly, especially in difficult circumstances, without jeopardizing the relationship. It seeks to preserve or enhance the current relationship while providing information. So the information is important to have accurate information, but accurate information in the face of debilitating personal communication doesn't go very far. It's easier if you have a good, solid relationship to clarify the accuracy of information because you've been 
communicating supportively uh, and building relationships, and therefore you can uh, enhance the accuracy of the message, but the meaning and the essence of it is there. So that's you know that's what this chapter is about. And in this chapter, in this module, you have a couple of exercises. Uh, and one of which deals with a young woman who's off at college and has a dialogue with her parents. Um, and it's an interesting discourse between the parents and the student. And you can talk about, you know, what factors of effective communication are present and which ones are missing and to what degree and that has had an impact on the attitudes and on the perspective and perceptions that the parents have and that the student has. So I'll leave that to you, but it's, but it's in there um, as part of the module's resource material. So, um, so before I leave this, and I just want to share the remaining five to eight minutes, uh, we're at 10 after now, so we can and between a quarter after and 20 after. But before I move over to the U Inc. paper, any, any at this point, any um, reactions or thoughts or anything you'd like to say about this new module that we've just launched? Actually, I gave some of it to you on uh, Friday, even though the video and uh, one of the uh, assessments or a couple of the assessments weren't going to be available. Till Saturday morning because that's how I had pre pre timed it and I didn't want to mess around with that. But any questions? Okay, so having said that, let me move to and this is uh, you know we're not going to go over this, but you can see it as well as I can in terms of what the relationship is. It's what we've been saying. Um, so hopefully you achieve both of those check marks by effective communication. But, okay, uh, so the U Inc. paper. Um, so in a nutshell of, five, of four arrow points, this is to be like a prospectus. If anyone has ever looked at a prospectus of... Uh, of buying uh, stock in a company, or more pertinent to maybe us, is it's like a resume. Uh, but it tells more than just the accomplishments. It also talks about the investments that you've made and the um, uh, uh, you know and what you're planning on doing. So when you look at a prospectus or an annual report from a company. It tries to bring the readership, which is very often stockholders or other stakeholders. It gives them a sense of what's been going on in Company X, Company Stu Inc. You know, what's been going on with the Stu Inc. company? And so that's what the U Inc. paper is all about, for you to write a paper that gives the reader primarily me in this case, but more importantly, you, as you write it and as you re reflect on it, an understanding of who you are. And so the major parts are that it asks you to talk about <coughs> um, what you're in business to do. And I mean, this can be, you know, you are you and you have, may have a family and children and so forth. What do you envision? What what is your, you know, uh, your goals and what kinds of things are your anchors, your values, and then where do you see things now? The current state of where you are as a company, you know, whether it's um, Aaron Inc. or Emily Inc., you know, or Stu Inc. or Colleen Inc. or Morgan Inc. or whatever. Uh, where do you see yourself and what have you done over the past couple of years by way of investments to drive you toward your desired solutions? 
and what have the investments yielded? So when you talk about a company making investments, you know, oh, we've replaced our machinery. Oh, we've hired some talented staff. Oh, we've, uh, you know, we've accelerated our communication network. Oh, oh, we've, uh, we've gone uh, global in this area or that area. Or, oh, we've diversified our suppliers, all of which is designed to make the company stronger. What have you done over the past several years? to make you stronger as an individual, as a uh, spouse, as a uh, parent, as a friend, as, you know, a, and as a, an employee, um, as a uh, social you know, uh, relationship type of uh, encounter, as somebody who is participating in, in community service. What have you done? over the past several years? And then what are you looking forward to doing over the next 12 months? And oh, by the way, the arrow that is not shown there is an arrow that says, what do you think you need to work on? Uh, where should you be devoting your energy over the next 12 months to, to help you achieve what you want to achieve? So that arrow point arrowhead is not there, but that gets down to the two skills that you are asked to um, to you know talk about that you would like to work on and your game plan for achieving growth in each of those skills. So the Ewing paper comes with a requirement for you to provide a healthy background and understanding of yourself. And of course, in that is the, uh, the resources that you have, all of the assessments. And I make a statement that um, the format and the, fr the framework of the Ewing paper can vary. I, I've given you a couple of examples, but I make a point of saying, look carefully at all of the underlined or highlighted portions that are in the appendix and be sure that you have included those. Those are kind of the requirements. So if I say to you, in, include a minimum of, I've forgotten how many I've said, let's say three or four assessments that you've used and why those have been particularly important, I want you to include the, you know, that minimum. If I talk about what your goals are, list your goals, list, um, you know, the, the, the two problem areas, list this or list that. Make sure that you've covered all of that. If I say state your values, then, you know, I want you to make sure that that's in there. And the papers that I've given you, the two examples, are ones that include all of the required parts and, and in addition, include other, uh, you know, more than the basics they include more robust embellishments to that. So that is, um, so that's the Ewing paper. And I think that's the last slide. Let me just make, yep, of that. So I'll just ask, I'll go back here and ask, do you have at this point, uh, recognizing that there are resources uh, in, not only in the appendix, which is, or in the syllabus, which is appendix one, but in this particular module, in the um, resource material for this module, there are those examples of Ewing papers. And again, they represent good quality Ewing papers, but they're not necessarily exactly as you have to make them, but they're designed to show you what a paper that has all the parts and pieces in it looks like. So uh, at that, at 17 after, let me just ask if there are any uh, questions or comments or anything related to the UE paper. I don't. I don't see anything among the three of you now. If you have a question, you can either answer, ask it now, and I'll be happy to take it and 
and I think it'll obviously be something that all of us will will um, gain from. But if you have a question and it comes to you later, then send me, you know, through um, uh, our system, at, you know, and, and Canvas. Send me an email through my LaSalle email. Ask the question. And if I feel like, you know, I'll answer you. But if I feel like, and in most cases I do, that it has relevance for everyone, I will answer you as a an announcement and send it out so that everybody sees the uh, my answer and benefits from your question and when I'm responding. So are there any are there any questions at this time with respect to um, you know anything regarding the U Ink paper? So I don't see anything, not not seeing anything, uh, any questions, any hands. I'm going to thank you. I'm going to stop the recording. It will be posted uh, probably, hopefully tomorrow, uh, if you have any need to, you know, look it over again. Uh, certainly Morgan will, will take advantage of it. But um, otherwise, uh, have a great evening. Thank you for participating. And uh, again, don't hesitate to call me or write me with any questions you have. And